to fly fish in still waters is using chronomid or midge pupil patterns. Not only is it it's fun because you have to determine what size and color are emerging before the fish get full feeding on the pupa and are off digesting the food for the rest of the day. So size and color is critical. And unlike rivers, chronomids in, in still waters can grow quite large because they're, they're such nutrient rich sinks. And we're very fortunate that in man, many Western still waters in particular, the chronomids or midges can get quite large. So it's not uncommon to be fishing chronomid pupil patterns that are tied on hooks as big as 10 3x. A number 10 3 extra long shank hook. We call them bombers. When I, where I come from in Camelot, British Columbia, we call them bombers. They're so big, they look like bomber airplanes flying through the water. And, and we love to see that because they're easier to tie. They're a big food source and fish really chow down on them. And fish get very big feeding on chronomid pupa. So I'm going to demonstrate the maroon chronomid bomber pattern that I tie. It uses the Stillwater Solutions mid stretch floss in the maroon. Maroon is an excellent color in general for a chronomid pattern. So I'm using on this particular fly, I'm using a slightly curved shank nymph hook, a number 10, three extra long. I've got a 764 white metal bead, a super white bead head, and that's going to be the gills plus add some weight to the fly. I'm using a dot tying thread and I'm just going to lay down a base and also use the fly tying thread to build up a bit of a taper to the body of the pupa. So this is going to look like a huge fly, but uh, there are lots of lakes uh, that you'll see the, the chronomid or midge pupa this large in real life. So they're a real, real treat to fish. A little different than fishing 18s and 22s on a river. We can actually see these flies to tie them on. So I've got a bit of a taper to the fly now. The rib on this fly is going to be two strands of wire, one red copper wire and one silver wire. So I'm just going to line those two strands up and I'm just going to tie them in at the bend of the hook. And then we're going to take our mid stress stretch floss, which is nice and elastic, and I'm going to tie it in just behind the bead. So, cinch your tire down tight and then stretch it out and lay it down. Just going to use it to build up the body a bit so it's stretched out. Bring the fly tying thread to the bead again and then I'm going to take the body material and just carefully form a body bringing it all the way up to the bead. Mid stretch floss comes in a lot of different colors and uh, a lot of the colors represent colors of the pupa that you'll actually see at lakes. So it's a great material to tie a lot of different colors of chronomid pupa. And again, we're tied it under pressure, stretching on it, so make sure you, you cinch down with your tying thread behind it and in front of it before cutting it off. Then we're going to take our two strands of wire. I'm going to take a couple turns as for a tag and then I'm going to wind up to the eye of the hook. And I, the, the two strands of wire don't have to be right next to each other. And what we're doing is we're trying to further, the wire is further, the red wire is further accenting the maroony, maroony red coloration. The silver wire is providing that hint of gas bubble that's trapped under the abdomen and thorax of the fly. So now we've got our rib down, we're just going to trim it off. And then I'm going to take my tying thread and cover a little bit of the, of the uh, white bead just to reduce the, the brightness just a bit. Like so, I've covered about a third of the bead. 
and then I'm just going to finish the fly off with the whip finisher. So there you have the Maroon Chronomid Bomber. Simple pattern to dye. Uh, you can use just change the color of the body to match the color of the pupa you're trying to imitate. Again, the white bead adds weight to the fly. It gives it the impression of the white gills and the combination of maroon body, silver wire, and red copper wire give you the other ingredients of what the real insect looks like. The next fly is an interesting pattern with a mature rating, right? <laughs> <laughs> the mature damsel nymph. What's the difference between an immature damsel nymph? Just so what whines we're, too much? <laughs> yeah. what, we're, what we're imitating here, Jack, is the fully developed damselfly nymph as they swim off the bottom, get to within about three feet of the surface, and then migrate hor swim horizontally to some long stem bulrush or cattails to emerge as the adult insect. And they do this en masse. And so this is the fully developed or mature nymph, and trout really do key on them. And you're going to have some flotation in this, obviously. Well, I don't put any flotation in this particular pattern, but we're using it in combination with a floating line. Oh, okay. So it's close to the surface. It's close to the surface. That's right. Well, I'm, I'm anxious to see this because I'm, I'm a big damselfly uh, fan because I've fished them. Uh, I've actually fished more lakes with damselflies outside of the U.S. in Australia and New Zealand than I ever did here. And there, uh, and I understand it, uh, that there's a good populations down there. Oh, huge. They call them mud eyes down there. That, and the trout love them. And I like that name though. Then mud eye, you know, sort of like whoa. All right, mature damsel flying in. Trout love to eat mature damselfly nymphs. By that I mean nymphs that have fully developed are swimming off the bottom of the shoal or the littoral zone up to within three feet of the surface of the lake and then swimming horizontally till they reach some long stem bulrush or cattail to crawl up out of the water, dry their shacks and allow the adult to crawl out. So it's completing the life cycle from the nymph to the adult. As anglers, we know when there's a mass emergence of damselfly nymphs because we can see them swimming sinusoidally through the water. I'm going to tie a mature damselfly nymph using marabou as the body and tail and then some pheasant tail for the shell back and legs. A very effective pattern, simple to tie. Um, when trout are on those damselfly nymphs that are migrating, you need a go-to pattern. This is the one that I use. So I'll start off with a a number eight three x long shanked hook. I've got eight dot light olive tying thread. For the body of the fly, I'm going to be using the Stillwater, Still, Stillwater Solutions Strung Marabou in olive dun in coloration. For the shell back and the and the um, legs of the fly, I'm going to be using the light olive dyed pheasant tail from Stillwater Solutions. Take my tying thread, form a base down the shank of the hook. Rib of this fly is going to be regular copper wire, fine copper wire in the regular, not in red coloration, just in regular copper wire. So tie that in. And then we're going to take our strung marabou and uh, we want to use strung marabou versus woolly bugger marabou because we need the longer fibers of the marabou because we're going to spin it and, and to twist, spin and twist the body to make the body. So marabou like so. And allow some for the tail. That, and I need a bit more material. Yeah, so I'm gonna take in total about half an inch of marabou when you, when you pull it off the, the stem. And remember, the, the marabou, when it's wet, it's, it, when it lays down and wet, it's, it's gonna be a lot thinner. The tail should be about three quarters of the uh, length of the shank of the hook. About that long. So now I've got the tail tied in. I'm going to take the marabou and I'm just going to grab it by the butts and twist it, spin it, your hand. And then I'm just going to 
wind it forward and retwist it to make sure it stays tight. We want, want the marabou fibers to stand out because the reason why we're using the marabou is that when this fly is moving through the water, the marabou pulses. And that'll look really great when it's going through the water. So I've tied that off. So I'm just going to take my rib now. And I'm just going to carefully wind it through, kind of wiggle it as I wind it through uh, the marabou fibers that are now standing out. So I don't want to mat them down too much. Tie that off. So. And now we're going to take our, our dyed light olive um, pheasant tail. We're going to pull off, cut off three or four fibers for the legs on one side of the fly. So I'm going to take the fiber, I'm going to lay it down the side of the fly. Time in so that they're on a, they stand out on an angle. And then I'm going to take the same three or four fibers for the other side of the fly to create the legs. So they'll be on the other side, like so. Tie them in. So now we got the legs out both sides. And then I'm just going to take my thine thread and, and carry on forward, tying down the rest of the pheasant tail because it's going to form the shell back on the finished fly. And then I'm going to take some modeled bee chain that's, that's been modeled, uh, painted on olive green in coloration. So cut uh, two eyes off and I'm just going to lash them in right behind the eye of the hook. So figure eight them in so they're in there. Okay, so we got the eyes. And then I'm just going to take a little bit more marabou to finish the, f the head of the fly off. And this time I'm going to tie the marabou fibers in by the tips. So they're tied in and then I'm just going to twist them again. So to, to make it easier to twist them, to grab them, you should wet your fingers, your thumb and your index finger and that'll give you a better grip on it. And you, you're twisting by the butts, so you're trying not to, uh, to damage the hackles and I'm kind of weaving it in and out a bit between the eyes, so, and then tying it off. And then we're just going to take the tag end or the bite ends of the uh, pheasant tail, pull them back between the eyes, so, and tie it off. That forms the head and the shell back. And then I'm going to leave about just under an eighth of an inch in length of, to, to further extend the shell back, to, to give it a more prominent appearance. One thing about the, the migrating mature damselfly nymphs is that their wing pads get very swollen as they get ready to burst out into the adult. And so by leaving this, this quarter inch piece of uh, uh, pheasant tail, it, it just gives the appearance of the swollen wing pads. And the beauty, again, of using marabou is that it pulses, breathes through the water, and like more natural, more lifelike. So I finished the fly off with a little bit finisher. Just make sure that everything's good on the tail, right length. Now fishing this fly, because the because of the mature nymphs are so high in the water column, this is, this is a floating line situation. Uh, floating line, 12 to 14 foot leader, tying this fly on, great to use a loop knot again, 
because the fly is going to undulate up and down in the water. And those fish will look up and see the nymphs as they're swimming horizontally through the water column. Lots of evidence of hatches occurring or emergence occurring because you see them swimming in the water. Or if you're anchored there, you look over the look at your anchor rope as you're pulling it up to move, and four or five nymphs fall off your anchor rope. Well, they've crawled up your anchor rope to emerge, and so that should put the light bulb on up in the brain there to tell you what's going on. So here's a nice uh, slender uh, swimming mature damselfly nymph. Trout love to eat damselfly nymphs, whether it's the immature stages of the nymph or the mature damselfly nymph. Mature damselfly nymphs, that, those are nymphs that are fully developed, swim off the bottom of the lake, off the shoulder of the river zone in shallow water, and they swim up to about a f three feet below the surface of the lake. Then they swim towards shore or towards some emergent vegetation like this grass that's growing here. The nymphs crawl up out of the water onto the grass. So this is a perfect situation where I am right now. I'm using a slow, clear, intermediate sinking line and I'm just fishing a damselfly nymph as it would imitate it swimming towards the grass to emerge. So I'm just using a nice continuous hand strip retrieve, not too fast, and then always interspersing two or three quick pulls just to add a little bit of different action to the fly. So the nymph is swimming. I'm retrieving the fly in the direction that the real nymphs would be swimming. Nice continuous hand strip retrieve. So, and then the odd quick pull. Okay. Now, when you're out on the water, you'll know that there's damselflies migrating because you'll see the nymphs in the water and they'll be swimming sinusoidally and they're, you want to make sure you figure out which direction they're swimming because you want to be casting the same direction where you're casting out and then retrieving your fly in the same direction that the real nymphs are swimming. There's always a few insects that are kind of left out on a lot of uh, when you when you a lot of books and stuff when you're trying to look at uh, patterns. It's always the chronomids and always this and that. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this one slips in, and I haven't thought of this fly in years. It was in the old books. That's it's a right. boatman. Water boatman. It's an important food source. It's not a food source that you eat every day. The trout eat every day, but it is important in the spring, particularly in early spring, and particularly in lakes that freeze over for the winter because water boatmen survive under the ice even though they're air-breathing insects. There's always pockets of air under the ice. So the day the ice comes off a lake, there's food, water boatmen. And so they're good then. And they're very good in the early to mid-fall when water boatmen go on swarming and mating flights to continue their reproductive cycle. And they're dive-bombing into the lake. The trout are looking up. They see them, get some great action at the surface, and then down deep. Do you know, I mean, is there some indication that this is happening or just something you have to have experience on? You, you, it, typically, you'll see water boatmen flying around because they're, they're air breathers. They're all, they can also fly from one lake to another. It'll be a very calm afternoon, sunny, and it'll, you'll start seeing raindrops hitting the water. And there, there isn't a rain cloud in, within 50 miles of you, but it's boatmen or back swimmers or cousins, uh, back swimmers that are hitting the water. So you want to have some of these. Absolutely. This is a simple pattern to tie. Simple. Uh, very simple, uh, but effective. You're going to tie the peacock version of this. The, the peacock water boatman. You betcha. And you're not going to use peacock curl. No, we're going to use peacock crystal chenille. A little flashier. All right. That sounds good. Let's take it away for the boatman. Water boatmen are another important food source for, of trout in still waters. They're particularly important early in the spring and then during the early fall period. In the spring, trout like to eat them because water boatmen survive under the ice if a lake freezes over in the wintertime. They're air breathers, but they come up and there's always air pockets under the ice. So when the day the ice comes off, there's water boatmen swimming around on the shoals and the neural zones of the lake and the trout will feed on them. In the early fall, water boatmen and their cousins, back swimmers, go on mating and swarming flights where they'll lay eggs and, and move the population around. And when they hit the water at that time of the year, 
they make a great food source for the trout. I'm going to show you how to tie a, a peacock water boatman, a very simple pattern, yet effective. I'm going to be using a number 14 or number 12 curved shrimp caddis hook. I've got a dot black tying thread. The legs on the water boatman, because they have a pair of elongated hind legs, I'm going to be using a piece of, of the midge stretch floss in dark summer duck. The body of this fly is going to be peacock crystal chenille. Okay, so it's, it's the crystal chenille is flashy and you want that glitter in it because when water boatmen dive into the water they take a bubble of air and they have a shiny mirror-like appearance as they're diving down. Okay, so to start this fly I'm going to be using some still water solutions light olive dyed pheasant tail for the back or the shell back. Form a base first with my tying thread and I'm bringing the, the thread back to the eye of the hook. I'm going to take the pheasant tail and I'm going to lay it down from the eye, behind the eye, all the way back to the bend of the hook. So, and then I'll be folding it over, finish the fly. I'm going to take the crystal chenille now and I'm going to lay it along the back as well, the bend, and then I'm going to form my body fairly close together. Get it up just behind the eye of the hook. So you can see how this material glitters in the water. So, so I've got my body. I'm just going to lay the pheasant tail over the back, pull on it pretty good, under tension as we cinch it down. Clip that off. So, take our whip finisher. Finish the fly off. So, now we're going to take our, our mid stretch floss. And what I've done is I've threaded it through a needle. Okay. So I'm going to take the needle now. These will be the legs. Do all the action. And I'm just going to put the needle through the material to the crystal chenille, um, below the shank of the hook, kind of wiggle around to poke it through like that. And we're just going to pull her through. And then we're going to get this and we're going to adjust. I'm just going to trim it off and we want the legs fairly long because long sweeping action it's something that attracts the, the, the attention of the trout so I'm just going to move it through like so trim it off so I'd say if, if, if we're looking at uh, how long these legs should be they're about one and a quarter times the shaft length of the hook so now we've got a a very simple pattern, but it has all the prerequisites to attract the attention of the fish. A shiny body, which imitates the trapped bubble of air. It's got the long legs and that help it swim through the water. Early spring and then early in the fall when, when these insects go on swarming or mating flights. And I'll just take a look at this fly to give you an idea how shiny it is and the body proportions. There you go. The best way to fish this fly, ideally, is with a full sinking line, a type 2 or type 3 full sinking line. Uh, casting out as far as you can and then allowing the belly in the line to form. So we're not using density compensated lines or uniform sink lines. Normal sinking fly lines, the belly will sink faster than the tip because it's heavier. We'll get this nice belly in the line and once we get the belly formed, we'll do fast four to six inch strips. And what we're doing is we're pulling the fly down and then pulling it back up, just like the real insect swims through the water. Water boatmen are most available to trout early in the spring, 
prior to any insect emergencies because the water's too cold. Water boatmen survive through the winter and they'll survive under the ice, even though they're air breathers, because when a, when a lake freezes over, there's lots of air pockets. It's not like a smooth sheet of glass on top of the ice. Where water boatmen are really important as well is in the early fall when the adult water boatmen go on 